All right. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. You're a giant head with loud noise. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, I'm just going to talk about a case that has been previously discussed, uh, and we've had a run of interesting paediatric missions uh, down in the gong recently, but this was yet another one. Oh, how did that slide get in there? Um, still tickets oh. available. Um, oh, oh, oh. The, uh, the gala dinner is sold out, but there is a wait list. Um, great topics, over 20 Aboriginal nations represented. Um, as I say, the website is live and registration site is still live. Virtual registration is available as well. So we're going to talk about a case from June. Uh, myself, Garth, uh, Jeff Yu and Bluey were the team, and it was quite close to us at Shoalhaven Heads, which is on the north side of uh, the Shoalhaven River. So this was the call, and I guess we're going to have a continuation of sort of an obstetric neonatal uh, discussion this morning. So this was a home birth with an obstructed labour uh, probable shoulder dystocia at Shoalhaven Heads. Um, we didn't know a lot of this information until after our neonatal resuscitation, but it's probably relevant at this stage to talk about a few of the things that we didn't know. So this was a 42-week um, G4P3, um, had had an absolutely unremarkable, unremarkable antenatal period and had a planned home birth. Um, there is a legal requirement, I believe, to have two midwives present for home births, but this was a very short labour, uh, about 25 minutes. So one midwife was on scene and one was en route. Uh, there was confirmed shoulder dystocia and the head was on view, blood, but cyanotic. Uh, the second midwife, uh, didn't make it to the scene and the father was uh, uh, instructed on some suprapubic pressure uh, to assist with the delivery of the baby. So I thought, look, um, shoulder dystocia is probably something that not many of us have dealt with. Uh, I haven't done obstetrics for over 25 years and I never managed to uh, be involved with a delivery of this type. This is the uh, New South Wales Ambulance um, uh, protocol, which we have available on our phones and, and uh, iPads. And it just reiterates that you need to get this baby out and what are some of the things that can give you an indication that it is actually a shoulder dystocia. So a good reminder for us um, who don't do obstetrics regularly, uh, and there's some excellent uh, uh, signs there. So failure of the head to turn to the side and even the uh, retraction of bub back into the vagina. <coughs> the other components of the New South Wales Ambulance uh, guideline are knees to nipples or McRoberts, which uh, is probably the first thing to start with because I guess in a Western setting, most people will be uh, supine. Um, the next is to try to get uh, the uh, patient onto all fours and in fact all my discussions with obstetric colleagues um, have reiterated that this is by far their preferred <coughs> method of delivery and then there's suprapubic pressure usually in combination with McRoberts. The also course oh, is an excellent course um, it for refresher, uh, I did it, done it a few years ago. Again, it's an in-hospital focus, but they have a, a little mnemonic called helper, and it goes through what they would do in a hospital situation. Um, slightly different to the circumstances that we may come across as a pre-hospital provider. Um, so call for help, I think I'd probably do that anyway. Uh, episiotomy won't change the anatomy in terms of removing the baby, but does give 
access uh, for fingers and hands to be inserted to allow for different manoeuvres. They then talk about McRoberts and suprapubic pressure and then a lot of uh, um, other manoeuvres, which I always, uh, when I was doing obstetrics, had trouble reminding myself what they were. So I'm going to try and simplify those a little bit. Trying to remove the posterior arm by sweeping it across anteriorly and then uh, getting them on all fours. So they actually leave that until last when they do that through this protocolised system. There are some last ditch manoeuvres, which we'll talk about a little bit further in a second. Uh, I'd highly recommend this uh, website and podcast by Ben Shepherd, who's uh, an emergency physician and retrievalist based in Mackay. Uh, ben resurrected an obstetric program with his partner uh, at a North Queensland hospital that hadn't had deliveries for over 10 years and they just shared doing the anaesthetics and the cesarean. So he's got a lot of experience um, with all aspects of obstetrics and he's uh, an emergency physician. Um, he gives a great little talk about shoulder dystocia and he talks about how do you get a patient who's supine onto all fours and he says you tell them that we need to get the baby out right now and most ladies will uh, be very happy to do everything they can to get on all fours. Um, so, look, in terms of a practical um, uh, use of those different approaches, I think that this would be an approach that I would think about. So, I think that we'd be calling everyone in this circumstance, everyone that you can spread responsibility to, um, getting knees to nipples and suprapubic pressure if they're in that position, trying all fours and delivering the posterior shoulder. And then I always used to get confused, you know, heads left, heads right, um, which way do you turn them for these different procedures? Basically, we're trying just to reduce that um, biochromial distance. So whichever shoulder is anterior, try and bring that forward, plus or minus, the opposite with the posterior shoulder. And then if that doesn't work, you can try the primary manoeuvre with the posterior shoulder. Um, last ditch manoeuvres, they're recommending after six minutes. Um, and again, these are pretty uh, severe interventions and very infrequently required, at least in an in-hospital uh, setting. Uh, Sim physiotomy sounds awful, and it is, but I've been told by colleagues that um, people heal up really, really well after this is performed, uh, and basically a local anaesthetic around the area and into uh, the ligament can help. Hysterotomy would be a whole different ballgame to what we've just talked about, because you've got an awake patient um, uh, that you will have to anaesthetise to do this procedure, so it really is a a very, very different circumstance. And you have to reposition the baby uh, back into the uterus. So all stuff that we did not want to do. So we're situated in the aircraft, which has just started up. And thankfully, we get this call, which is still terrible, but at least I'm hopefully not dealing with an obstetric problem. Oh, we're not dealing with it. So the baby was out but blue and in arrest, and CPR had been commenced. I'm still not 100% sure if this was two-person CPR at the time, um, but I'm sure that the father was involved under the midwife's instruction. And when we look at the outcome, uh, I think this probably saved the child's life. So look, what are we thinking about? Well, we've got our cues that we use every day. Um, we're starting on the first page for this one, four kilos. Um, I also have the Monash Children's Hospital guide, which um, uh, has a few more aspects to it and is a little bit more complicated. And I'd highly recommend this guide. It goes up in half kilo increments if you get the paid version. Uh, we've also got our newborn life support guide. And look, I, I keep this in my pocket. 
um, because there are differences, as we all know, and it's nice just to have a reminder. We don't do this every day. Um, but critically, the, the two heart rate uh, levels that guide exactly what you're going to try and do, uh, the differences in the CPR ratios, uh, the options for um, venous access, a little reminder on your adrenaline doses, and we had some adrenaline drawn up uh, for this particular case en route, uh, and also what you're aiming for with SATs, which is not normal um, because their their whole system's still adjusting, as we know. Um, there is a very good uh, version of this that is the New South Wales Ambulance Guideline, and it actually it uses that basis, but also reminds us that if the baby is very premature, then there are a couple of different things that you do. You don't stimulate them aggressively because that can uh, cause problems, and particularly cardiovascular destabilisation. Um, it reminds us about the head position, which we're all used to, uh, but it's nice to be reminded when we're going to a, a case that's unfamiliar. Uh, probably most of us who are over 40 will remember what suctioning in babies used to be like. It was very aggressive, especially if there was meconium. And there's just a, a reminder just to have a, a slightly uh, less aggressive approach to suction in newborns. And also something that despite every algorithm reminding us, I still routinely forget the sugar and it's much more important um, in these babies. So just, there are some great resources that we all have available. So um, the ambulance service uh, paramedics got on the scene about 10 minutes after delivery. Uh, CPR was ongoing. But when they checked the baby, they actually could feel a pulse um, of about 130, which was an excellent start. And they, um, but the baby was still blue. Uh, it was breathing, but not effectively. And it was very, very floppy. So again, I think one of the critical um, points in this whole case is the provision of oxygen through that LMA, which they inserted. Um, they had a size one LMA, which we don't carry. Uh, and maybe that's a point of discussion for later. Um, and they were able to assist to a normal respiratory rate. They did have an attempt at a right tibial IO, uh, and it was a great attempt with an old Cook's catheter. I think any of us who've done a bit of special care nursery or NICU will know that that's a very, very difficult procedure uh, to get right, such a small target and with a, a non-easy uh, I.O. device, it's even harder. So that good on them uh, for giving it a go. Uh, it hadn't worked. So we met the team, and actually it was a very senior team, and that was another point of, uh, of luck in this particular case. So many of you will remember Jeff Egan, who used to work for us uh, down at the Wollongong helicopter. Uh, he was the... Uh, primary position on the scene <clears throat> and um, so we got there about 40 minutes after delivery we met them on the sporting oval and honestly I think both GT and I were thinking this is going to be bad um, we're going to be doing some CPR and proceeding to a local hospital but looking in at this baby we realized wow uh, these guys have done just a tremendous job and we're going to have to do some stuff here. So basically our initial assessment was that there was a, a size one LMA in situ with a good seal. The baby had some spontaneous resps, but not uh, up to a normal level for gestation and was being assisted. They were easy to ventilate uh, and the breath sounds were equal. And the hemodynamics were impressive. So uh, the baby was pink, uh, had a essentially normal numbers and was relatively warm, although a formal temperature showed that the temperature was 31, but um, skin temperature felt better than that. 
Um, not much happening neurologically. Uh, so GCS3 pupils were reactive, but basically no tone. Um, a BSL had been done and it was eight. And there was a fair bit of umbilicus uh, um, umbilical cord to play with. Uh, so we had that in the back of our mind as well. So basically we had a term baby who'd had a hypoxic cardiac arrest with normal lungs. So a different circumstance to some of the things that uh, for those of us who've done nets in the past have dealt with the premature baby with stiff lungs. It wasn't that situation. Uh, and it was a large baby in comparison to uh, some of those NETS missions. So uh, we did what we do normally, which is basically take the baby uh, out of the ambulance to get everything set up. We, we thought, although there were problems with the temperature, that we just needed a clean environment to be able to get everything organised. This was not a run-of-the-mill um, uh, situation and just to do things as we would normally. So we're actually outside. Uh, we continued supportive ventilation, optimised the head position to achieve that. Um, without instruction, GT went to the leg uh, we talked about what options we had with access and we thought just given that it was quick, we would try for an IO first and then move on to other modalities if we had to. And he's obviously got a career before being a, an ICP because he was very gentle, careful and got this in first go. So that saved a lot of time. I knew we were proceeding to a laryngoscopy and intubation and my limited experience with these babies who've in this situation where it's primarily a cardiac arrest in a term infant is that they're still very, very fragile uh, and less is more. So in order to optimise the situation before having a look down, we, I, I would routinely give a small bolus of fluid, um, and this was just normal saline, so a 10 mil per kilo bolus, just to give our hemodynamics a little, um, a little kick. So I might just talk this through and then display the video in case it doesn't uh, display well. So we were using our CMAC2, uh, we did have rock uranium in a weight adjusted dose drawn up, but we were hoping not to use it. And I'll explain more about my thoughts there in a second. So we're aiming for a cold laryngoscopy. We had a 3.0 cuffed ETT with a stilette and we got a good view and secured uh, at an appropriate uh, uh, depth. Uh, there was um, clinical and end tidal confirmation and we assisted the ventilation to a respiratory rate of normal and then placed a nasogastric tube and a rectal temperature probe. I just on, again, past experience, I gave another bolus post procedure just to smooth the whole process. And you could definitely argue against uh, that the neonatologists are much more cautious with boluses than we are. So, look, I'll um, just see if that's going to play. We did a BSL afterwards, which was 8.5. So I'll, I'll talk this through. Um, not great end title, but not a great uh, connection, I think, rather than a reading problem. Little baby. So you can see the tone there is very reduced, no paralysis or sedation at this time. Slowly, slowly. Still breathing. I don't know whether you call that a grade zero or not, but um, slowly, slowly.
All right. And I know people have uh, reviewed this and thought, well, why didn't we just paralyze the baby? Uh, I've, I guess I don't know the evidence. Um, the, my experience is that these babies are cardiovascularly very, very, um, has the potential to be very unstable. And then everything that you can do to reduce that instability uh, helps. They're also very floppy and have zero tone. Certainly that was the case in this baby. So, um, Children like this are being uh, cold tubed every day in the both operating theatre setting and and uh, delivery suites um, without any problems. Uh, and I just think it's one less thing to add to the mix. And I've seen babies crash after uh, being given paralysis in this circumstance. So. I think we had it available and it is a very different situation to the premature stiff lung uh, intubation where it is impossible to get good views and to do a, a speedy laryngoscopy without doing an RSI. But this is a very different circumstance. So I guess that was my reasoning. We can perhaps talk about it more in a second. Uh, we then, th and this was one of the other uh, wins that we had on the day. So ACC were able to put us in touch with Kath Carmo at NETS, who is extremely helpful. And I think the advice to go direct to RPA NICU really saved an enormous amount of time and angst uh, going through an emergency department. She was able to give us a little bit of advice about her, the preferred options in regard to fine tuning the post intubation management. So a little bit of fentanyl, try not to paralyze again, um, just to reduce the complexity and allow for uh, better uh, observations at the other end. Um, pressure control ventilation, which is the standard sort of starting point for most neonatal ventilation strategies and try and wean the oxygenation if possible. And despite writing up thousands of first day fluids years ago, I'd completely forgotten about the 10% dextrose infusion for day one. So she was able to remind me about that. Um, at this stage, in the packaging stage, and we were very lucky to have an, an extremely uh, senior team and very involved team, and everybody was doing something. So for five minutes, I went and had a look at mum, um, and she was stable. Thankfully, we didn't have a second patient, and very, very calm um, and accepting of what was happening and the decisions made to transfer the baby with dad. Even though she, mum was well, uh, she'd had a small PPH and was going to pr proceed to the hospital. So we really didn't want a second patient in the aircraft with us. Uh, it's probably worth reminding us that we've got these accessible in our road cars and there's some useful things in here just in case we need them. So there's uh, some clamps and lots of devices to allow warming of the baby and, um, and of the mum as well. So en route, uh, we were able to wean the ventilation significantly. So we were getting fairly large uh, mils per kilo tidal volumes with the initial settings um, up to around 40 mils. And so we're actually able to wean the, the pressure uh, down a little bit to 16. And we just, we probably could have even gone further with the FI2. Uh, baby was breathing spontaneously at almost a normal rate by this stage. Uh, another blood sugar was 12. I'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the, the warming process, but I would probably do this differently in the future. Um, we used uh, Bluey's beanie on the baby's head, and you can see those ridiculous adult uh, ear defenders there, um, but probably they're covering half the head surface, so that's probably helping a little bit. And we were pink and sweet, and our temperature had come up by 0 0.7 degrees, but we're still cold. We just look, we're looking at each other going, when is something going to go wrong here? 
with these OBS, but they just were persistently okay. Probably that pulse rate's a little low, but um, everything else was going so much better than I think both of us expected. This was the umbilical artery um, gas on arrival, and even that was not terrible. So obviously some residual acidosis, um, but CO2 okay and all the other numbers fairly good. So in follow-up, it was a rocky time for probably three weeks. Um, they had to continue. They were actually very, very happy to see us. And I'd forgotten what a nice uh, and friendly environment RPA NICU is, but it was, I think, the largest baby in the unit um, with the least problems probably. So they were happy with what we'd done uh, and it was a very uncomplicated handover. And so I think that that was um, encouraging for us uh, and also saved a lot of time going through, I guess, EDs that are um, wired more for paediatrics and for neonates. But it was a very uh, a lovely welcome. But they continued to ventilate the baby. They um, were not so disappointed about that initial temperature um, and proceeded on to do... Uh, cranial cooling uh, to try and avoid ischemic encephalopathy. They obviously um, did formal catheterization of the umbilical vessels within the first couple of hours. Uh, the initial head ultrasound on day one was normal um, and they were hoping initially to be able to extubate quite early but in the first week um, baby just wasn't able to control secretions very well or feed very well on extubation and so was re-intubated a couple of times. And actually at week three, discussions were being had about what the future looked like and even um, whether there might be uh, palliative measures um, commenced. And then as neonates do, things just turned around all of a sudden. Um, so they proceeded to get a head MRI, which was normal. And there was just a progressive improvement in week three and four in baby's ability to control secretions and suck. And at day 20, um, Bub was discharged home, which was not looking like the outcome that we were going to have initially. So I think we got some extremely lucky breaks here. Um, Thankfully, this wasn't an obstetric case. Uh, although I had some ideas, I didn't have any experience in shoulder dystocia personally. Uh, and uh, I was very glad that we weren't dealing with a second patient. Um, and I think the fact that the baby was term large and had normal lungs was um, a massive break for us so that the fact that they weren't premature was extremely helpful. There were lots of things that went well. I think they were extremely well resuscitated um, initially on delivery, and I'm still not 100% sure how many people were involved in that process. I think the early LMA was absolutely critical. Um, as we know, there are lots of different techniques that we get used to, to thinking about when you're bagging a neonate, you know, getting the head position right, trying different positions to optimise ventilation. And then usually, especially in this term group uh, with normal lungs, they're usually easy to ventilate if you can optimise, uh, you know, your head positioning and shoulder positioning. But for a team of two people uh, doing multiple things at once on the scene, I think the LMA probably made an absolutely massive difference and was a very good call. And I think the combination of the uh, midwife and initial paramedic teams um, saved this child's life and uh, that we just uh, optimised what they'd already started. Um, we also had a a lucky break with the EZIO uh, and 
thanks to GT for that. I, I was watching him do it, sort of silently praying that that would go well because it was just going to save us so much time and um, it was done with such expertise. So I think that was um, a, a great thing that was able to be uh, inserted into the management. Just a slow staged intubation with thoughts about um, backup options. Uh, you know, that was some, that's something that any of anybody in this room, um, despite perhaps not having had a lot of neonatal experience, would be comfortable with. The CMAC um, was uh, fantastic. And as we know, it, neonates can be intubated with a size four, just have less blade in the mouth. So, um, but that, uh, that went well. And then the coordinated tasking transfer and disposition planning just made life so much easier. It, it helped in a relatively stressful situation just to consolidate some of the fine tuning for the management. And I think just getting to the right place on the first um, trip was uh, just saved a lot of time. So as always, there's some relearning. Uh, temperature and blood sugar are just so critical. So um, pink, sweet and warm is the mantra for these little babies and getting that right. Reminding myself about first aid fluids, maintenance fluids, um, some of the drug options and the ventilation options, which um, I guess are just slightly different to what we might start with, but um, it's always good to have those re reminders. So I guess there could have been some alternate approaches. Um, the whether should the child have been intubated at the scene? Uh, look, honestly, I think the LMA uh, was in this particular case adequate and very very useful. Um, and for I think for teams uh, that um, are not retrieval based, then that's completely the right thing to, to option for. Um, and I don't think that it would have made a lot of difference in the in this particular case if they were intubated at the at the bedside. There were certainly a lot of other different alternate vascular access options. So, you know, standard lines, a long saphenous option um, is often a quick and easy option to go for, but again, would definitely take longer than an easy IO. Um, would ultrasound have been helpful? Not in my case. Um, uh, I think I have trouble with the hand-eye coordination and lack of video game experience with adult ultrasound guided IV access. Um, but the umbilical vein would definitely probably have been a very good option in this case. Um, and we're going to talk about that in a second. I think I've talked about why I proceeded with the way that I did it in uh, this particular intubation. Um, I don't think an RSI would be wrong, um, but I don't think personally that it was necessary in this case. Uh, and then warming techniques uh, is an interesting one. I think in the future, I would have utilised our Glad wrap just to allow for uh, radiant exposed heat in the cabin to actually get to the baby. So um, blankets and the space blanket in particular uh, probably just keep baby cold when they're in a warm environment. So it stops the external heat getting to them. We had a combination of our warming blanket protected by uh, the space blanket. So was that achieving a whole lot? Um, I'm not sure. Our temperature did go up by nearly a degree, so I guess um, we were certainly sweating in the back of the aircraft, but um, I think that I would have, uh, even with the IO in, tried probably to quickly wrap this baby if I'd had another chance. So just a quick reminder about umbilical vein access. Um, it's usually fairly easy, um, even though it's not something we do every day. Uh, so the anatomy uh, is relatively straightforward. I've talked to a couple of neonatologists since preparing this talk. My only concern with them really was 
would they be happy for us to do this in a pre-hospital environment? And they said 100% yes. Uh, they said they probably would very, uh, you know, make another incision, uh, but don't lose too much of the um, umbilical cord and then just insert to five or 10 centimetres uh, and be up once you're able to aspirate blood. And they would be completely happy with that being done in a relatively unsterile environment. No need really to suture in place, um, and then they can change that out at the other end. I guess we have a six French feeding tube, which is good enough for a term baby. Uh, we may need to think about something smaller in a premature baby, which would be perhaps a once in 20 year job for us, I guess. Um, ben, who's Ben Shepherd, whose uh, website I spoke about before, um, has obviously a particular obstetric uh, uh, exposure and experience and a slightly different patient type in the setting of Mid-North Queensland where he works. So the potential for his service to get obstetric and delivery cases is probably higher than our own. He's actually delivered uh, a baby in the back of a 139, having miscalculated how um, how soon labour was going to occur in a very short trip uh, that he had probably an eight, 18 months ago. But he's set up a, a small obstetric pack. And I guess we've talked about having this that might be a grab pack if we're aware of this type of situation that we're going to. Um, so probably we have a lot of these uh, options available to us within our pack already, but there's some uh, extra additional things that we don't have. So some of the neonatal uh, delivery box type um, agents that are present in the MAP pack, we don't have accessible in our aircraft. There's a few extra drug, drugs for different um, obstetric problems like preeclampsia, PPH, um, and it may be just an, op an option to think about in the future as to whether we have something like this available, perhaps in a bag that costs more and doesn't have Shimano on it. But um, uh, so look, that's uh, the case and I, I, it has been chatted about before. So uh, I just thought I'd give a little bit of extra information and um, yeah, happy to take any questions.